in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Dear brothers and sisters, today brings us to a significant day in our calendar, which is the Sunday uh, commemorating the Seventh Ecumenical Council. This is a council that's mostly known for uh, its defense of iconography, but it goes a bit deeper than that. It goes a bit deeper than saying that we like to beautify our place of worship, that we like to beautify our, our prayer corners or, or where it is that we do sacred things. It goes much deeper than that. What this is about is about the incarnation. And so today, what we'll be talking about is our incarnate faith, our embodied faith. It's not a coincidence how it was that our God revealed himself to us, how our God um, came onto earth. He did not come as a vision. This would be the ultimate in disembodiment. A vision that does not have matter, doesn't have form, would have been very appealing to the philosophy of the period. Yet he chose not to do that. He chose not to send an angel. He chose not to appear as an angel. Or, in fact, anything close to that. An angel came and said that Christ is coming. Many angels. But Christ came not as an angel. Not as a vision. But, and not even as a book. When we hear words like the word of God. It's, uh, it's common to understand this as being the Bible, the book of scriptures. And there is a way that we can understand this as being entirely correct. But when we look to those same scriptures and find a description of the word, we see at the beginning of, of John that this word is Jesus Christ, who was there from the beginning. In the beginning, as it says, was the word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. When Christ came to us, He used none of these, none of these methods. He became embodied. He became enfleshed. He took this on. And this is of no small significance to us. It, it teaches us that it is what comes from a person that has their stamp of authority on it. We indeed use icons to proclaim the importance that Christ came in flesh, that Christ came embodied. If he did not, neither of these two icons next to me would be possible. Neither would be possible because we're depicting God who has been unseen. But it's because he took flesh and, um, and dwelt with us and became one of us that these are even possible. And that they're, they're not only possible, but reverenced and treated with the greatest of respect and venerated. What this teaches us is that it's not just our minds that are saved, not just our souls that are saved or our hearts that are saved or anything else disembodied but the whole person, that our whole person has been saved by Christ, by his coming to us. And it's so easy for us to forget this. It's so easy for us to forget that love your neighbor begins with those physically around us. We live in perhaps one of the more disembodied times in the history of humanity where previously we might talk about visions as something that individuals might receive. We might have oracles that we'd have to travel for many thousands of kilometers to see. And this would be the extent of our understanding of things disembodied. For us, disembodiment is a norm. It's a norm for us to interact with each other without the need to be physically present. And this is through a number of um, a number of outlets, 
or all on the internet, or most on social media. Um, we know about people from the other side of the world, the, the strangest, closest details of their lives. Yet we don't know them. And vice versa. It's a very disembodied time. And so, not that this should be dis disregarded, but that we should remember that there are people on the other end. There are people on the other end of our comments. Even in YouTube comment <coughs> sections. If you've been to YouTube comment sections, you know exactly what I mean. But we should be better. Behind every username is a person. We're talking to real people. And yet, we know intuitively that what happens online, what happens in that disembodied space, can't replace what happens in real life. What happens where we do live. It's no replacement. It may be... It may be beneficial, it may be helpful, it may be a number of other things, but it's no replacement. And so knowing this, we should live it out. We, should, we must build relationships where it is that we live. Not on, not on a hypothetical idea, or at least not only on a hypothetical idea, but focusing on where we do live. Where, where our minds, bodies, souls live. Building relationships here. When it comes to loving our neighbour, we help the people we're physically near. Because we see them. We see their hurt. When Jesus was asked, who is my neighbour? He could have said everyone in the world. But he didn't. He said that the one who was the neighbour was the one who physically went over to him and helped him. This is the one who acted as neighbour, who loved as neighbour. And so this is where we begin. Not where we end, but where we begin. With our household, with our community, with the people around us. And from there we go further. We see each person as a living embodiment, as an icon of our Lord and Saviour, as an icon of our God in heaven. Icons are representations, and we have great reverence for each of these. But more so, and more so, we should cherish each human around us for at least the same reason. Each of these carry not only representations of human, not only representations of the image of God, but are the means by which we may be saved. May God help us to see this in each instance of our life. Amen.